So in a short few moments, I'm just going to share with you a story of how God has so faithfully and graciously led us to where we are today. Um, to begin with, I want you to know that when God spoke to Abraham in the book of Genesis, from chapter 12 onwards, he told Abraham something very, very interesting. He said, I want you to leave your father's house. I want you to go to the land I'm showing you. He said, I'm going to bless you, and you're going to be a blessing to many nations. And all those who bless you will be blessed. All those who curse you will be cursed. Genesis 12, 1 to 3, you see the full uh, pro uh, protection and providence blessings from God. There are three things we can actually derive from these few scriptures from the book of Genesis chapter 12, and that is whenever God calls, he anoints. Anoints means the ability to do what God called us to do. That's basically anointing. It's something spooky. And God, whenever he calls, he also gives direction. Direction means there's a sense where to go. You may not know exact address, but that normally is a sense of direction. Just as the rain comes from the heaven to earth, just as the there's a cause for every river. God gives us a sense of direction, and as long as we follow the guidance of the Lord, we will gravitate towards that which God calls. And the last thing that we can derive from this uh, call that God gave Abraham was the fact that God provides. When God calls, He provides. By the way, not if God calls, because God calls, and when He calls, He always provides. And the providence of God, it includes Financial, it includes spiritual, it includes material, psychological, physical, every aspect. God's providence is complete, as stated in the book of Psalm 23, where he is the shepherd and we are the sheep. Now, the Bible also tells us in Matthew 22, very interesting, Jesus made, gave us a story about a king who invites all the people to a wedding, and then many of them uh, were not coming, especially those specially invited guests. Some of them said, no, nah, I've got business to do. Another one said, you don't understand, I'm going to get married. Another one said, no, I'm busy, I need to go bury my family. And eventually, he told his servants, go out and invite everybody, anybody else in the streets, bring them in. And then Jesus made a very interesting statement. He said, many are called, but few are chosen. Very interesting. The call of God, sometimes we're mistaken and we think that the call of God is for some special people. It's not for some special people. Who are those who are chosen? Everybody is called. Who are chosen? It's those who respond. If I had a, your phone number right now, yes, you're seated down there, and I take my phone and I decide to call you on your phone, and I decide to ring each and every one of you, those of you who have received the call can make a choice whether you want to answer the phone or not. How many of you have received uh, prank calls or these salesmen and saleswomen who try to call you because they're trying to sell something? How many of you have received? I don't know about you, but normally I quickly block the numbers and I say, don't call again. And sometimes they try to use other numbers. Maybe they're using an IP address. And uh, so, but if, if, if your friends call and you know it's your friends, you answer, you have a choice. Many are called, everybody is called. Those who answer the phone, so to speak, to God are those who are, so to speak, chosen. Does that make any sense now? All right? So it's important to understand that uh, God is calling every one of us. And not everybody has a unique story like what me and Lillian have had. Um, having said that, it's important to understand that everybody has a story. It's not about how big or how small your story is. It's just the fact that today happens to be the very day, 30 years ago, when we landed in this wonderful land called Denmark. I must admit, when we first arrived, we were not very, uh, you know, wonderfully, powerfully uh, excited because when we arrived, it was supposedly summer, like today, the 2nd of July. But for us, coming from a country where the temperature is always 30 and above, and even in Africa where it's always beautifully warm, when we arrived here, and I think maybe it was 18 or something, and we were freezing cold. We literally were walking around the streets with a winter jacket, and I think we had gloves, if I'm not mistaken, even a hat on because it was so cold, winter boots. And I remember when we went down the walking street, people were looking at us as if we came from another planet. 
And they were like, what is wrong with this? And all Danes are walking around with shorts and T-shirts and we were like, I mean, these people, they must be God's chosen, frozen, because they were complete, we were freezing. That was the beginning. But just to give you a little uh, history as to what happened prior to that, it's now I'm 58, when it was 17 when I got saved. I don't know what, at what age, Lillian, you got saved, but around about 16, 17, 15. Wow. So we were both from Singapore, and of course, born and raised in Singapore, multicultural. We were moving uh, in our own religions, and in the time, there was a revival. When I say the word revival, I mean that there was a mass movement where many people, hundreds, if not thousands, were suddenly coming to the Lord. Uh, miraculously, some by vision, some by prayer, some by just you know, sitting down listening to a song. People just flooded the church. That was a phenomenal movement of God uh, from Muslim background, Hindu background like me, Buddhist background like her, uh, uh, even people who are nominal Christians. They were just flooding the church. And it was a phenomenon that we couldn't explain. We just called it a revival. That's why I want to substantiate that statement, what revival actually meant, for us at least. Right after that whole season, uh, we, very, we were involved in a church that was very, very much, uh, you know, getting you into uh, the ministry, uh, ministry, getting you to serve the Lord, getting you to go to cell groups, and uh, we spent several t- days in a week going to the church. And it's not because we had to, it's simply because we wanted to. We found Jesus, and it meant the world to us. We were in the church in the day, we were in the church in the night, and we, we made new friends, and the church family suddenly became like our family. And we just simply couldn't help it and wanted to keep on going because we, 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 we were, our souls were starving for God. And in that atmosphere, the church started not only to train us as cell group leaders and train us as ministry leaders, but also train us as missionaries in order to send us out. So we were going to different parts of Asia and different parts of uh, uh, Africa, different parts of Europe, sent out as missionaries. So I want to just focus on these past 30 years when before me and Lillian came to, to Denmark, she was in Philippines and Malaysia, East Malaysia, West Malaysia, Philippines, uh, Zimbabwe, Kenya, Zambia, and uh, she was uh, while she was in Kenya, that's when we met. And just prior to that, you know, in the, the past, uh, I've been in the ministry for, for over 40 years now. And prior to coming to Denmark for 30 years ago, I was first in West Malaysia and then in, in, in India and in uh, Ghana, Uganda, Philippines. Uh, it was just when we were in Uganda when Lillian and me met. And uh, we came here in a time when we have been so you know, involved in the ministry and I must admit exhausted, as a matter of fact, burned out because we've just felt we've given everything the prime of our life. And when we arrived 30 years ago, it was supposed to be minimum uh, uh, six months commitment we made and even though we were given a two years visa to come because it's a work visa. Arrived and we were picked up in the airport exactly this day, 30 years ago. That's unbelievable. And uh, Lillian arrived, uh, and me, with, that's why, Ulf, thank you for those gifts, literally with two suitcases. She had 20 kilos, I had 20 kilos. We were both exhausted. We were both burned out. We were like, I don't know why we're here. I think maybe I should leave the ministry and just go back and, and do something else. I always had an inclination for business, and I thought maybe I should just go into business. It was that time we arrived, and the church that we were supposed to pastor is a a Danish-speaking congregation, because we've had missionaries here before, and suddenly here we are to to, to sit down and and, and teach and preach. We didn't understand a word of Danish. I couldn't even remember the names of the members of the congregation. I mean, I don't remember names, period. But, I mean, we had names like Greta, and we had names like Erling, and we had names like... Names I've never used before in my entire life. I'm like, what, 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 what a name. It was hard for me to remember, even the names. And then, like, like I told you, it was cold. And uh, we had two suitcases, and we were asking ourselves, what, what do we do? And just before we left Uganda, it was very, very successful ministry. We planted one church. It grew to be the largest church in that particular city. And then we planted 12 churches. And then we adopted 300 churches. 
we, we have a massive ministry where we were really busy and tired. But when we came here, all of a sudden we, we were pastoring this small little congregation. And there's nothing wrong with a small congregation. But not only that, there were people who were very disgruntled. Many of them were elderly Danish uh, women who were a little bit disgruntled with the church that they used to be in. So when they came, a lot of the times they were just, you know, angry about the other church and complaining and grumbling. And then, of course, we, we didn't speak the language. So every time they speak to us, we have to wait and then ask the translator, what are they saying? And then try to understand what they're saying and try and respond. And I was very surprised. And uh, I still remember that uh, we were not used to everything. One particular Sunday, which I'll never forget, uh, I still remember it very well. We had a missionary with us from Malaysia. She was helping us. Some of the missionaries that were there, they already left. So that particular Sunday, on a Sunday morning, I was all prepared, you know, got ready and, you know, to prepare my sermon because we have to do it to translator. And then uh, my missionary friend was my translator because she spoke a little bit more Danish than I did. Then there was me and Lillian and this missionary who was supposed to do translation. And then Sunday service, we sat in the, in the home in the church. It was a house church, and we were waiting for members to come. And then we waited, and we waited, because Danes are usually very much on time. And I was surprised because two people turned up to church, only two, two old ladies. I mean, I'm nothing against ladies, let alone old, you know, but thank God for it. But, uh, <laughs> and then they were sitting down, very quietly listening, and then when the service was over, one of them came to me because she wanted to criticize what I was doing wrong. And I felt very hurt because I was really trying my best and it was not good enough. And then another one came to me and then she was trying to supervise what I should be doing. And I was completely blown away because it's amazing. Even among the two people that turned up, one came to criticize, the other one came to supervise. And I remember when the service was over, they left, and then I told Lillian and the other worker to leave, and I was alone in the hall. I closed the door, and I was lying flat on the carpet. Where nobody was there. And I said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? <laughs> I, felt, I felt like Jesus on the cross being crucified. I'm like, God, what am I doing here? Why, Lord, why? And uh, it was a very, very uh, rude awakening. It wasn't the, the most wonderful experience. But after that, I must admit that, you know, we, 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 the church grew to a very nice size, and then we handed it over to a Danish couple, and then the church that we were working with then was the Pentecostal church. They told us to take over a congregation, or, or rather start a congregation, because they had an English-speaking group in the Danish church. It was slowly disintegrating uh, to the point that there was only 12 people left. And uh, they said, can you please do something because we need this group to grow? And I said, sure, I can do that. And I took the group of 12 people, we moved the church to a hotel, and we had a wonderful ministry. It grew from 12 over a period of nine years to over 200 people. In, it's not about numbers, but it's just very successful compared to the church uh, life in Denmark. And when we finished pastoring that church for a period of time, that was when God led us to start this church. When I say God led us to start this church, ICC started in a way that 21 years ago, where first of all, there was not at that point in time in Copenhagen, what we call an interdenominational church. We had Pentecostal church, we had Baptist church, we had Methodist and so on and so forth. But because there was no interdenominational, I realized that English was like the common denominator it brought people together and people from different walks of life. Um, so we decided that we'll start something, and that was basically started without any financial support from anybody, not from Singapore, because by that time our church in Singapore said, if you're going to stay in Denmark, you're on your own. And at that time, we had left the Pentecostal church, so the Pentecostal church said, thank you so much for nine years' uh, service. Here is one month's extra salary. Bye-bye. And that was it. And then uh, we uh, thought maybe we should go back to Singapore, maybe we should stay. We, we had given everything in the church, so we didn't like, have big, fat saving accounts. So I told Lillian uh, that, uh, what do we do? We prayed. Two people, one from Australia, another one from South Africa, calls us, and I remember telling this to Lillian, exactly the same message they gave, and I was surprised that they didn't talk to each other. They said, 
we feel maybe your time in the Pentecostal church is over, but we're not very sure if your time in Denmark is over. Can you please pray about this? Because maybe you are like the eagle, the eaglet, which is in the nest, sometimes is being pushed out by the eagle so that it will begin to fly. We believe this is the transition you're going through. That was 21 years ago. And it was exactly the same thing. So I asked them both. One was Colin White and the other one was Graham. I said, did you guys talk together about this illustration? They said, no, we didn't. Uh, we just felt that this is what the Lord is saying. We, we might be wrong. So very pragmatic at that time, I said to Lillian, I said, you know what? Let's pray about this. Does God want us to start a church like this international congregation? And we prayed about it 20, uh, 21 years ago before we started this. That was nine years after being in Denmark. And the, the, the irony <laughs> is that every time we have been involved in the ministry, wherever it is, God has been kind and always blessed it. It's the same with the cell groups that we started back in Singapore and the churches that we've started in, 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 in different parts of the world. The ministry always, God blesses us and it always grows. And it's amazing how somebody always comes and says, oh, thank you so much for the growth, it's now ours. It was the same with the last church we were pastoring here, which was the English church. And we said, okay, fine, it's, it's yours. We just walked away without doing anything. So I said, I'm not sure if this is God, but uh, let's pray. So we prayed and I said very pragmatically, Lord, I think I have enough money in my bank to maybe, maybe pay three months' rent for a small little hall. And that's all I'm going to do. And if, if this is you, because we don't, we're not going to ask anybody for funds, we're just going to believe that you will move people if, in case they need to support this ministry, and then we're going to uh, do what uh, you want us to do. We started the church with... Uh, three months that we thought we could run the church and I said if anything beyond this is going to be you otherwise we'll shut down and move back that was 21 years ago that's how ICC was started we never went out to raise funds we never went out to appeal uh, for people to support or bring the church that we left we never even let them know that we we're going to start another church because we didn't want to have people come over out of the 220 I think about 20 people found us we didn't go calling them it's not ethical to do that because you don't split churches if people search you and find you, it's okay. And uh, that was how ICC was started, and we arrived here literally 30 years ago with two suitcases, <laughs> like Ulf said, and Andy. Um, and and we, we didn't know what was going to happen, whether we were going to stay or we were going to go back. Um, today, after 30 years, as I look back, out of this one God we believed in, and when we came with uh, his blessings, uh, he not only has blessed us, you know, with, first of all, we came with two suitcases. I think the biggest blessings we have is that we have two children, which is really, really the biggest blessings we can ever have. Uh, we have got, uh, God has blessed us with uh, not one, but two houses. I can, and I can just say thank God for that. And then, you know, God has blessed us uh, with uh, even two vehicles, not one. Uh, God has blessed me, not with uh, two wives, but one wife. That's good enough. Thank God. Thank God. <laughs> and in the meantime, God has also taken care of this congregation. Uh, till today, still, just by faith, with people's willingness to say, I want to take care, I want to bless this congregation. Um, in education-wise, when I came to Denmark, I barely even completed my bachelor's. I just had a, a, a diploma, not even a bachelor's degree. And uh, through staying here and continuing to study, uh, we have completed not one but two PhDs, which even I am blown away that, that, that the Lord has helped. Um, but as I look back, I never ever dreamt that we will eventually, after being uh, in Denmark for so long, decide to give up our Singapore citizenships, which we did. That was how many years ago? I can't remember. 15 years ago. Wow, okay. Uh, so, you know, and, and, and decided, to, when we finally decided we're going to actually uh, adopt uh, Danish citizenships by becoming citizens, and our, our sons automatically as a result of that becomes, even though they are born here. Our families were very confused. They were like, are you sure you're going to give up your Singapore citizenship? Uh, do you know how important the Singapore passport is? Because they thought that our identity was in Singapore. This outfit that Lillian and me are wearing today, actually, uh, is, I did it by purpose, is in recognition or remembrance of the single, this is a, uh, can you say a national um, cloth? 
uh, fair fabric from Singapore. Uh, when you, if you have traveled in Singapore Airlines, you probably have seen that all the air hostess and so on are always bearing this material. This is because it's supposed to be like our national uh, material, if that makes any sense. Um, but we have learned one thing in these past 30 years that it is not about your nationality. It's not even about your um, uh, identity in terms of what you own or what you have or what you... Uh, if you're, it's all about your trust in God. And over the past uh, 30 years, God has uh, taught us to simply trust in Him. Hallelujah. Amen. And uh, for us in ICC in particular, we come from so many different nationalities. Uh, I think we have about 30 to 40 different nationalities when everybody is here because now it's summer, some of them have traveled. But the beauty of it is that we serve the same God. And we come together not because of our um, fact that we all are the same. We come together simply because we have the same God in spite of our differences. Now, God has never come to change your personality. Did you know that? Okay, some of you maybe. Let me repeat, run that through once again. I said God has never come to change your personality. That's not what God has done. The whole reason why he created you is because he wanted you. He wanted this person with this personality. That is why you have a fingerprint that's next to none. You have the iris of your eye that's next to none. You have a DNA that's next to none. Because that's how God created you. But what God came to do was that in the midst of this fallen personality, so to speak, He came to help you so that you can put on Christ. Hallelujah. Because your personality is basically what is stated in Romans chapter 12. All those uh, motivational gifts, that's your personality. That's why some of you are gifted in one area, some are gifted in another, and that's the way God made you. That's why it's, there's certain things that make you tick, and there's certain things that makes you, I don't, I don't want it, I don't like it. That's, that's the way you are, that's how you're made. But God, through that what we call motivational gifts, He came to also give you spiritual gifts that you can ask for so you can enjoy the Spirit moving through your lives as a result of His spiritual gifts, you're able to see that, hey, my, my, my personality can, can be moved by the Spirit to do this. That's why He's inviting us to the highest call, which is the ministry gifts. All of us are invited. He calls. Like I told you, who are those to whom He calls? Those who? Respond. Listen and respond. Everybody is called. But who are the chosen? Those who respond. When you respond, so you move, you, you use the motivational gifts. You ask for the spiritual gifts. You move on to the ministry gifts. And when you move on to the ministry gifts, it's all about service. At the end of the day, when we are humans and we understand that our God has created to be me to be a servant, to serve the Most High God. And if only we can put aside our own selfish pride and vain ambition, and put on Christ as he came to serve the people around him, not to lord it over them. You see the difference? When we understand that, we'll be able to understand and enjoy the service, the, the blessings that come from God's hands. Our entire life is about serving God. And that's why he made us, because he wants us to put him as the top priority. Amen? Um, I was just a little story before I end, because I know we are going to go and eat. I don't want to take too much of your time. I was just telling Prince, uh, when he graduated just here on, on, on Wednesday, I was there for his graduation, and I was very excited over the fact that he did his defense for the master's thesis, and, and of course, uh, the censor has to give him a, a, a what you call a, a result. Um, now, you know, as you know, me and uh, uh, Lillian, and uh, me and mostly Prince and Joe, you know how part of our personality is that I always like to joke, and that's just me. I can't help it. It's just in me. So just a little story before uh, the censor giving the joke. When we arrived there, we wanted to go earlier just to make sure we know exactly where the hall is. So we arrived about 15 minutes before time, 
and there was nobody in the hall, and uh, Prince was already there with his laptop, and he, had, he was running through his PowerPoints to make sure the presentation is all ready. So we arrived, and we said, hey, Prince, how come there's nobody? He said, there's still 15 more minutes. We said, ah, oh, okay, we have time. So we sat down, and, and then uh, this stranger walks in. He's the sen- we didn't know he was a censor. So he looked like a nice guy, and we you know, greeted him. How are you? What was your name? So I shook his hands, and then uh, I knew that Prince's three supervisors are going to come, but I didn't know who this guy was, and... And even he didn't know who the guy was. I said, but, but uh, who are you? And then as a very nice, you know, he's a, f- a Frenchman who's been in Denmark uh, for 18 years. Very, very politely he said, um, oh, um, I'm just the censor. You know how in Denmark we always play things down, right? He said, I'm, I'm just the censor. But we were like, you're, you're just the censor. You are the guy who's going to give the, the final results. And I was like completely shocked. So, you know, when I was shocked, I was like, whoa, wow, nice, nice to meet you. Then, you know, he'd never seen me, never known me before, and I, I, I just joked with him immediately. I said, uh, so how much do I pay you? So then he looked at me with this shock. <laughs> and then Prince was completely shocked. He said, Dad, you don't joke with a censor. You don't bribe a censor. You know, of course, I was joking. And then Prince just went up to him. He said, that, that's my dad, and he's, he's always joking. And uh, then, then, then Prince said, but seriously, how much? <laughs> And the guy looked at Prince and the dad, he was like, my goodness, this bunch of lunatics, I'm supposed to. Anyway, when he came, got to know us, he was like, oh, okay, yeah, you're just joking. But at the end of it, you know, he, Prince finished and then he, he gave him uh, the best marks possible, actually. He gave him 12 in Danish standard, that's the highest, you can't go any further, because he did a good defense. Um, then after that, I was joking with, you know, we were having a little champagne and we were having the celebration. And so then the censors were there, all these three different Danish censors. I told them, I said, hey, you know, uh, earlier on, you guys were not here. But when he first came, I just told him this joke. And the censors looked at me and they were shocked. They said, you did what? <laughs> I mean, the supervisors, you did what? And they burst out laughing. And then they looked at Prince, he said, and he, they said, you know, now I know where you get your, your sense of humor from because Prince is always joking with the, with the supervisors. But um, uh, the reason I'm saying this to you is because I told Prince, I said, one thing I appreciate was the fact that you were so busy during this period preparing for your thesis, but you never missed your, your church. Only once, one Sunday you, you had an appointment. Yeah. And, and when I was doing my PhDs in, in, in Copenhagen, I was pastoring a Danish church, an English church, I was running a Bible school, and I was doing one, but not one, but two PhDs, not once did I miss my commitment to God. And that's because, not because I'm boasting, I'm not saying you've got to do this, and if you didn't do it, don't, don't feel guilty. This is not about guilt. This is about an encouragement and an invitation to a higher level of service. That's because that's how we fell in love with Jesus when we first came from Singapore. We simply wanted to serve the Lord, and that's all that mattered. And that's how, they, he got an example. He said, I've seen you, Dad. I've seen how you work worked very hard. You never missed anything. And, and I want to follow that example. It's not, I didn't tell him that he has to do that. But I'm just saying this is what we call challenging each other. We provoke each other towards good works. Amen. And be a wonderful, wonderful encouragement. Be a blessing to God's kingdom. Because at the end of the day, when this breath that you're breathing is gone, and trust me, it will be gone one day, you, you, you know that it's going to be God that you're facing. So all the time and energy and effort that you're investing in so many things, ask yourself, how does this affect my eternity? Or is it just temporal? And since we arrived in Denmark, and you know, now I'm 58, and our time is, I would say, you know, the, the peak of my life is gone. And now after 30 years, I am, can't believe when you just say 30 years, it sounds like, wow. It's just like that. But after the 30 years of being here, my interest is not about what, what, what can I get out of this country? What can I gain? My interest and my prayer is that how can I inspire more men and women to serve this wonderful God? Because like I told you when we came with two suitcases and what the Lord has blessed us with today, it's... It's, 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 it's unbelievable. I can't even, I, I would have never dreamed that I would be here today talking to you. But God has been faithful. And he's going to be faithful to everyone in spite of who you are, irrespective of who you are, because he's great. Just be thankful to God. Just be grateful to God. Just be faithful to God. And continue to always serve him. He will take care of the rest. 
At the end of the day, we're all only going to serve Him. I know you might be here maybe because of your job or maybe because of your education or maybe because of your marriage or whatever reason. Uh, it doesn't matter. God, serve God. Just serve Him. Serve Him and be faithful. Put Him first. Everything else is temporary. Uh, it's not important. And don't, don't find excuses why I cannot do this, why I cannot do that. Don't find excuses. One day I, I, I told Ulf that I really appreciated one beautiful meme that he posted on, I think it was Facebook. Uh, he's, he talked about two groups of people. There are those who, who will find a solution to every problem. And then he also talked about there are those who will find a problem for every solution. You know what I'm talking about? You know some people, right? <laughs> Be among those who are solution seekers. Amen. There was a problem in this world. Sin entered. But God found a solution to get us saved. And the reason he got us saved is because we were all, like we were praying before the service, I was mentioning in the prayer group that we were all sentenced to death. We were put in prison and locked. The keys were thrown away. And that was it. We were just waiting for the sentence to be carried out, the execution of the sentence. But Jesus came, opened up the prison door, and set us free. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen? He made a solution for us. Therefore, you owe your life to Him. If only you understand the depth and the height and the width of the love of God. He gave His life. What else can He give? Amen? Serve the Lord. Serve the Lord with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength. Love Him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's what uh, the best thing we can do. And when you do that, you will suddenly find that everything else falls into place. Amen. So that's my 30 years story. Actually, there's much more because we've been serving. I got saved, like I told you, when I was 17. got baptized when I was 18. There's a lot more. But God is good. Amen. All the time. And now you know why it's so important to say and to sing Thank you, thank you, Jesus, with all my heart. Amen? <laughs> Amen, it is. And I know that every one of us have a story. It doesn't have to take 30 years. Uh, it probably is just 30 days or 30 seconds. God can make all the difference. Just focus on Him. Don't focus on the issues that you're going to. I'm not telling you to be ignorant of it or, or to be, uh, you know, just be disconnected from it. Know that God is bigger than all that you're going through. And if I only had time, it would take more than 30 minutes to tell you what has happened in 30 years. But that's the only time I want to take. And in the meantime, tell you that all glory and honor and power and praise be unto God. And if there's anything I can do uh, is to challenge you, serve Him, serve Him, serve Him. Amen. You don't have to go out and buy two suitcases and uh, travel to another country where you are right now. Yeah, one is enough. <laughs> where you are right now, serve Him. And then when you look back, you realize, my God, I never knew that. I never knew that. I never knew that. It's worth it. It's worth serving the Lord. Just serve Him. Amen? So I'm going to ask you to be so kind to stand together with me. Uh, I'm going to also first have a word of prayer, and then after that I'm going to ask the ushers to help me to share the communion so that we can uh, share the communion together before we go on with the rest of the service. But uh, as you stand, um, I know that uh, most of you that are here, you, 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 you believe in Jesus, you trust in God, and that's why you are coming. But maybe there are also some of us here that you somehow feel, maybe I have been close to Jesus, but I just feel somehow a little distant from him, it's okay. It's okay. There's, you, you're never too late to come back and dedicate your life and say, Lord, I want to dedicate myself to you. I look at this man's story uh, and it's inspiring and I'd like to be led by you. And I want to tell you one thing before we pray. Before I was saved, uh, before I knew Jesus, I literally had nothing. I was a nobody in life. I never had dreamed that the Lord will do what he did to me. But the moment I turned my life over to him, he took something that was nothing and made it beautiful. Amen. Hallelujah. So if you think that, hey, Ravi, I'm cool, I'm fine, I'm okay, I've got whatever I need. Okay, good, I'm, I'm happy for you. Move on and thank God for that.
But if you're in a place where you feel, you know what, I've been there, done that, and got the T-shirt, even got the selfie, nothing seems to satisfy me anymore. I have this hunger, and you need Christ. He fits in this heart of yours perfectly. Amen? So if you feel somehow I'm a little distant, today is the time to come back. So if that's the condition of your heart, I want to ask you to pray with me this prayer. We can pray together, the rest of us, just to encourage the rest, is to dedicate our lives to God and ask Him to lead us. Amen? Why don't we all pray together and say, Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name and thank you for all that you've done. Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Forgive me, Lord, of all my sins and cleanse me from every unrighteousness. Holy Spirit, lead me, guide me, abide in me. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done. And let my life be a testimony and a witness of thanksgiving and worship. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Father, I want to commit every single person that is here. Also, those who will probably watch the recorded version of this, that they would turn to you and know that you are the maker, the creator of heaven and earth and everything that has breath. Lord, it's a joy and an honor for us to serve you. I mean, what else can we do, Lord? You made us for that. And we know when sin entered the world, it hardened our hearts. He gave us a sense of pride, of being disconnected from God and to trust in the arm of flesh to believe we can do things without you. And Lord, I confess that even as your children from time to time, we turn away from you and turn our backs on you. But we thank you that you have never left us. You have never forsaken us. And you have called again and again. And those who responded to your call You chose them. You picked them up from the miry clay. You washed them and made them clean. And Lord, I pray that our experience with you will be not just earthbound, but it will be eternity bound. That we will have a bigger picture of our purpose and we'll be able to understand that it's a joy to serve you and be a witness for you to ask men and women to come back to their creator, to their creator. And be that which you want them to be. I commit myself and each and every one that is here within the, the voice of the sound of my, my voice that they will be able to, to respond to you with all of their heart, mind, soul, and strength. We want to serve you, Lord. We want to serve you, Jesus. We thank you and praise you. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.